Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shive. And I'm Tracy McRae. Macular degeneration is a leading cause of vision loss, affecting more than 10 million Americans. That's more than cataracts and glaucoma combined. In macular degeneration, the center of your retina, now remember the retina is that light-sensing tissue in the back of your eye that's similar to the film in a camera, and the central part of that retina is called the macula, and that's what begins to deteriorate in some people with age. And when that happens, it can cause blurred central vision or a blind spot in the center of your field of vision. There are two types, wet macular degeneration and dry macular degeneration. Many people will first have the dry form, which can progress to the wet form in one or both eyes. Here to talk about macular degeneration is an expert on the disease, Mayo Clinic ophthalmologist, Dr. Sophie Bakri. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Bakri. It's nice to see you again. Thank you. Dr. Sophie Bakri, good to have you on the program. So this uh, is a condition that seems to be coming more and more common. I mean, we heard little about macular degeneration, or at least I don't remember hearing much about it a decade or two ago, and now you hear about it all the time. Well, in a way, that's a good thing. I think it's because we have treatments, and um, as the treatments get better and better, we're trying to encourage patients to get the disease diagnosed earlier because um, earlier detection is earlier treatment and better visual outcomes. Um, Talk about the risk factors. I mean, obviously age, and that's probably part of the reason that we're seeing more cases because people are living longer? Uh, Definitely. Um, So age is the number one risk factor, um, but also uh, genetics as well. So if it it can run in families? It can run in families. Um, The genetics of macular degeneration is uh, very complex. Um, There are some commercial um, test kits out there, um, but again, it's very difficult at this time to really interpret the data um, So you mean there's a test kit where you can tell if you carry the gene for macular degeneration? There are several several genetic um, uh, polymorphisms. But you're not convinced that they're that accurate? Well, um, they, they are accurate, but difficult to interpret. All right, so age, number one risk factor. But there are others, aren't there? I mean, diabetes, smoking, obesity. So um, besides age and uh, and, and genetics, uh, obviously race comes into genetics. It's more common in Caucasians and, uh, you know, patients of northern European origin, um, less common in Hispanics and African-American patients. Um, In terms of other modifiable risk factors, I would say that smoking is the number one modifiable risk factor. Um, Hypertension as well and and cardiac risk factors can be associated with uh, macular degeneration as well. When it comes to something being age-related, you know, if you live long enough, maybe everybody ends up with macular degeneration of some sort. Does that happen? Not necessarily. Um, Not necessarily. I mean, I've seen, uh, you know, some very healthy uh, 85-year-old maculas, and I've seen some not-so-healthy ones afflicted with macular degeneration. And likewise, I've seen patients uh, present with macular degeneration, um, you know, as young as uh, late 50s. Um, What about sun exposure? Is there a relationship? Um, Quite possibly. Um, So we certainly advise patients to uh, wear UV-protective glasses when they're out in the sun. The usual symptoms, how do, how do patients present and, and why? So uh, usually patients will notice either a blind spot in the center of the vision or uh, blurriness or that lines are no longer straight and are appearing squiggly. Um, uh, many times, you know, the patient isn't really thinking about macular degeneration and is unaware. And so sometimes um, patients have these symptoms for quite a while before they actually present Uh, to an eye doctor for diagnosis. So they're not really sure what's wrong and they just sort of put it off thinking that it might get better? Exactly. And that's why we need to increase awareness about macular degeneration and symptoms um, because when you start to get squiggly lines, it could quite possibly be um, an early blood vessel sneaking under the macula. And the earlier we treat that blood vessel, the better the outcomes. When it comes to macular degeneration, the center part of your vision is what you lose. So those squiggly lines that you're talking about, do you see those in the center of your vision or are those off on the sides? No, they're in the very center, unfortunately. And how do you make the diagnosis? Can you look in someone's eye and say, you have macular degeneration? 
So um, certainly clinical examination, you know, looking in the eye, um, we often um, see hemorrhages, um, macular thickening, uh, indicating fluid, uh, drusen. Um, uh, Dr- drusen? Drusen are spots under the retina. It means uh, rock in German, I think. <laughs> and uh, you typically see those with dry macular degeneration. But we have some very sophisticated diagnostics in the eye clinic, and that allows us to detect macular degeneration very early. So, for example, if somebody presented late, say, with one eye, and uh, you know, it's pretty late when you see hemorrhages, um, for example, in the retina. So as that's some bleeding that, that you actually see, some blood yes, collection yep. of blood. Often it's, it's bright red blood. But the patient's going to be more alert to something happening in the other eye. And certainly with frequent visits to the eye clinic and frequent treatments, we scan the second eye as well. And we're able to detect any changes in the second eye much earlier than what was detected um, in the first eye. If it's something that happens as your eyes get older, is what's the benefit of finding it early? Can Is there medications to stop it? Or what? Do you, what what's the benefit? So um, um, as you mentioned, there are two kinds of macular degeneration, the dry and the wet. Now for the dry kind, if it reaches a certain stage or the intermediate stage, um, and to, to diagnose that stage, we look for these drusen. Um, rocks. You, can you look rocks, for rocks. <laughs> basically. <laughs> <laughs> we, can, um, we can prescribe um, uh, vitamins. There are eye vitamins that have been shown to slow down the progression of this dry macular degeneration by about 20%. Um, we also recommend a Mediterranean diet, for example. Um, that's been shown to be beneficial in slowing down the progression of macular degeneration. Um, so I think lifestyle changes and vitamins can make a change if the dry kind is detected. But once the wet kind is detected and we see that blood under the macula, it's time to treat with eye injections. <laughs> Just let that I, sink I've heard in about there. these people <laughs> coming in once a week or once a month for eye injections. Tell us a little bit about that. That really doesn't sound like much fun. So... Um, I won't comment on that, but all I can say (laughs) is that we numb the patients really well. We use uh, numbing drops, and then we sterilize the surface of the eye with uh, betadine to prevent infection. And the needle that we use is very, very tiny. We use 32-gauge needles, so that's uh, that's about the size or smaller than than insulin syringes. And um, with our techniques, most patients don't feel anything at all. Well, and if the option without those shots is that you lose your vision, they're probably pretty motivated to come in and get those shots. Yes, so patients patients are motivated, and certainly those that aren't, in, uh, those who skip an injection um, for whatever reason, whether it's that uh, they don't want it or convenience, once they start to get those symptoms back, they soon realize how much they need these injections, and they become uh, very good at returning for their Probably appointments. Problem is you can't close your eyes when they're doing it. Oh. <laughs> I'm sure that they can work around that. Uh, Is this for both the wet and the dry? So the injections currently are just for the wet kind. So um, they um, shrink down the blood vessels. And uh, the reason that we often give them once a month is because that's the duration uh, of the drug. And uh, what we find uh, usually is that for the first six months or so, patients need the injections very frequently. But often as time goes on, we can extend the interval between injections. So um, I have many patients that only need the injection once every three months, for example. And, and when you are injecting this, you put it right into the fluid in the central part of the eye? Is that what you're doing? And, and what does the, inje- the, the medicine do? So uh, we inject uh, the medicine through the white part of the eye, right into the vitreous cavity where the jelly is. And then that medicine seeps through the retina and uh, blocks a molecule uh, known as uh, VEGF, V-E-G-F, vascular endothelial growth factor. And blocking that molecule causes the blood vessel to shrink down. That's amazing. I mean, that's a great gift that that can help patients in that way. What if someone wants to delay the onset of macular degeneration and they're not going to start taking those vitamins yet? I know you don't want to hear this, but if kale is the answer, are you ready to eat some kale for lunch today? <laughs> no, I'll take the vitamins. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, tell but us, what are some of the foods that would be great uh, for your mac- to prevent macular de- degeneration? So um, uh, before foods, we have to think about a healthy lifestyle. Not smoking, I think, is the number one thing. Exercise has been shown to be helpful as well. Um, and in terms of diet, um, salmon, sardines, 
fish high in omega threes, uh, nuts, and of course kale, spinach, leafy greens, mm -hmm. and just think colors on the plates. Okay, but you talked about vitamins, not only, uh, but but mainly in terms of of treatment. What vitamins are you talking about? And would it be wise if uh, macular degeneration runs in your family to start taking those vitamins sooner rather than later? So that's a great question, and, and I get that question all the time. So that's been studied in the age-related eye disease study, and those vitamins have only been shown to be effective in slowing the progression of macular degeneration if mm -hmm. they're given to the intermediate stage of macular degeneration. So when the ophthalmologist looks in and there's a certain number of uh, drusen, um, that's when it's most beneficial. For the very early stages, it hasn't really been shown to be beneficial. That's when we recommend the lifestyle changes. And when you're talking about vitamins, are these something that you can get over the counter or is it a specific vitamin? So, uh, yes, the, uh, it's called the Age-Related Eye Disease Study, AREDS formulation number two, and they are over the counter. Uh, say that again. The so AREDS, A-R-E-D-S, number two, AREDS two formulation. They're over the counter, and that has certain doses of uh, vitamins uh, A, C, E, zinc, copper, lutein, um, zeaxanthin as well. But you would only take those if you were diagnosed with the intermediate stage of the dry? Yes. Essentially, uh, the ophthalmologist would make the recommendation to take those vitamins, and um, you would then buy them over the counter. All right, we've been talking about macular degeneration with a Mayo Clinic expert ophthalmologist, Dr. Sophie Bakri. Time for a short break. When we come back, we'll learn about Dr. Bakri's latest research, including a clinical trial for treating another disease of the macula. Can you say this for me, please? Macular telangiectasia. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. We are back talking about eye diseases of the macula with Mayo Clinic ophthalmologist, Dr. Sophie Bakri. So, Dr. Bakri, we know that you're doing some research on a different disease of the macula called macular telangiectasia, or MACTEL. <laughs> Tell us about that. And, and, of course, the difference between that and macular degeneration, the standard type. So um, MACTEL is a disease that affects uh, the macula, the center of the vision. And what we often see is tiny squiggly uh, blood vessels around the center of the macula. Sometimes there are also um, uh, missing parts, missing photoreceptors, degenerating cells as well. So we often see some uh, little tiny gaps in the macula, some tiny holes. And... Um, MACTEL is a disease that we really don't know too much about, and that's why there's uh, so much excitement about research in this area. So it occurs in uh, patients who are you know, 40 to 60 years um, of age. So younger than the usual type of macular degeneration. Younger, and um, it, it looks different. I mean, sometimes, you know, there's some overlap, but I think with the sophisticated testing uh, that we have, we can definitely differentiate MACTEL from wet age-related macular degeneration. And it's not as common as macular degeneration? No, it's very rare. It's actually called an orphan disease. Wow. So tell us, what, uh, what are you coming up with as, for treatment? Because up to this point, there's been no treatment, right? So th there's been no treatment. There have been many things that have been tried. Um, for example, um, with the new blood vessels, um, you know, we've tried to shut them down with the same injections as macular degeneration, but that really hasn't worked very well. Um, it's come to light now that as well as being a disease that has these squiggly blood vessels, it's also a uh, neurodegenerative disease. So it causes degeneration of the retina. And these new treatments are really uh, targeting retinal uh, regeneration or delaying of the uh, degeneration of the retinal cells. So what are you doing to them? So For them. For them, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so there are actually um, two parts to this research. Um, this uh, research is a part of a large uh, consortium funded by the Lowry Medical uh, Foundation. And the first part is really a multi-center study to uh, look at the phenotypes of MACTEL. So phenotypes it means doing a lot of imaging to learn more about how this disease can present and how this disease can look. 
We're also uh, doing genetic testing of um, affected uh, patients with MACTEL and also their family members. And so um, by having a lot of patients participate um, in this uh, study, which is basically a registry study, we can learn a lot more about how MACTEL presents and the genetics of it. So Are the symptoms fairly similar to macular degeneration or, or different? Um, patients present with blurry central vision, so um, there is a lot of overlap with symptoms. But you can tell the difference based on looking in the eye, or you, do you have to do more sophisticated testing to differentiate so between the two diseases? I think with either disease, when it reaches the later stages and things are really obvious, um, then it's much easier to diagnose than when uh, we see patients with the earlier, more subtle stages. That's what requires more imaging. But I think that the reason to do imaging, even when it's obvious, is that there are so many different stages and so many different manifestations of the disease um, that um, it's really important to uh, figure that out. So the first thing you're trying to do is develop a registry so you, you can group all of these patients together and study them because the group is relatively small, correct? Um, yes. Um, the, I mean, the number of patients uh, nationally and uh, you know, internationally is very small, and that's why it's important to have um, as many patients as possible participate in this so that we can learn a lot more about the disease and particularly the genetics. And then what's the treatment that you're, that you're working on that could help these people? So um, the treatment is, is very exciting. Um, it's a phase three trial where 50% uh, of the patients uh, receive the treatment and 50% of the patients uh, receive uh, you know, the sham, the pretend treatment. So what the treatment um, entails is surgically implanting a small device that releases cells into the vitreous. And, uh, these and the vitreous, again, is the jelly inside the eye, the middle part of the eye. Yes. So it's implanted in the operating room. It releases this uh, uh, factor called CNTF, or ciliary neurotrophic factor. And um, these are factors that help the retinal cells um, uh, stop degenerating. And so there's some evidence so far. When you say phase three, that three, that means that you've already tried it in some patients and it, it showed some promise, and so then you get to go to the next phase. Exactly, so you know, phase th in the phase two study, there were some really strong signals that this was effective in slowing down the degeneration of the retina. And so for the phase three, uh, we uh, you know, have an even larger number of patients. And obviously the study design is a lot more refined, but it's a 24 month study. Um, and we'll be doing uh, lots of uh, retinal scanning and um, uh, image comparisons. Um, in the sham versus the treated groups. So that's sort of interesting, sham versus treated. So if you're going to do an operation on the eye to put this inside the eyeball, uh, what do you do to the patients who, uh, you, do you do the same operation, only the, uh, the sham patients don't have a drug in whatever you put in there? So the operation is uh, modified um, so that the patient... Um, uh, you know, has uh, some stitches in the eye and doesn't really know what's gone on, but the patients do not get uh, the drug. Amazing. Uh, okay. wow. Well, pretty exciting, uh, <laughs> particularly since there's never been a treatment for MACTEL before. Right. No, it's, it's very exciting, um, but it's also um, it's a novel treatment approach as well in terms of implanting a device in the eye that releases cells to prevent a degeneration and that acts in the long term as well. Well, so a sustained mm, delivery device. We really hope that you continue to get positive results from this study. Yeah, thank you. We've been talking about macular degeneration and macular telangiectasia with Mayo Clinic ophthalmologist Dr. Sophie Bakri. Dr. Bakri, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much.